Chapter 27A Review The Male Reproductive System. This was a relatively short chapter, but there were some confusing hormones, LH and FSH, which regulated different processes in the male reproductive system. The rest of the anatomy and physiology was relatively straightforward. Located at the edges of all of the seminiferous tubules are stem cells known as spermatogonia. When these cells undergo mitosis, one of the two copies remains a stem cell, but the other one differentiates into sperm. To do so, it must undergo meiosis, going through two rounds of cell division, which halves the DNA, leaving four immature spermatids. These must undergo spermiogenesis, the process of becoming a mature sperm cell. This involves ejecting most of the organelles and growing a flagellum. This mature sperm cell could then detach, enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubule and travel towards the epididymis. In addition to these developing sperm cells and stem cells, the seminiferous tubules contain nurse cells, which among other things, maintain the blood testis barrier. This is a barrier between the sperm in the lumen versus the bloodstream. Remember, these cells did not exist during fetal development. Therefore, the immune system would detect them as foreign. So we must prevent white blood cells from attacking the mature sperm. In the next part, we'll see that a blood ovary barrier is not necessary because all of the oogonia were present at birth. Sperm will travel up the lumen of the seminiferous tubules to the reti testis and then can be stored in the epididymis until an ejaculation occurs. The epididymis contains numerous stereocilia, which are not cilia at all, but microvilli. This is for increased surface area. One of the main functions of the epididymis is to provide nutrients to the sperm in storage. Sperm do not last for a very long time, and if they are not ejaculated, they will be broken down and recycled into their component parts. These amino acids and other molecules must be absorbed in the epididymis. So the microtubules also increase surface area for better absorption. From here, sperm could travel up the vas deferens to join up with fluids made by the seminal glands and prostate to become semen. This would then travel down the ejaculatory duct, out the urethra, and be ejaculated from the body. When the bladder fills with urine, this can trigger a reflex whereby parasympathetic fibers running along the pudendal nerve can trigger activation of the bladder. The parasympathetic fibers of the pudendal nerve can also trigger vasodilation of the penis, which leads to an erection. Other things that can trigger parasympathetic activity include REM sleep, which is why many men will wake up with an erection. That does not mean that they were having a naughty dream. All dreams are parasympathetic in tone, and that leads to erection.